get it down a little bit. Go. Okay. Tell me if but you want it. Uh, Is that all right? Yeah. How's that? I'm going to do a selfie good? at the end. Yeah, 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 we've got to do a selfie at the end. We'll do it out there. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yes, they have been Glen 20, they're not. Whenever I'm talking to a room full of women about my career and I explain that before I started Mamma Mia, I was a magazine editor and I have this slide that I put up with a whole lot of magazine covers from the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s from Cosmo and Clio and Dolly. And the reaction in the room is always really split. The women who are over 35, they go, ah, like they audibly let out this kind of happy, nostalgic noise because they remember those iconic covers and the models who appeared on them, like Elle McPherson and Tonya Bird and Alison Bray and Sonia Klein, Nikki Taylor, Claudia Schiffer, and of course, Cindy Crawford. And then the rest of the room, the younger women, they go like this. They look blankly at the screen and then at me. And the same thing happens when I try to explain what magazines meant to us in a world before the internet when I'm talking to younger women or even my teen and teenage children. It was a time before Google searches or social media or group chats or podcasts and certainly before Mamma Mia. Until the internet, the only form of women's media was magazines. There was just nowhere else to find any information that you needed about being a woman or a girl. Magazines were also really glamorous and they they filled that role, I guess, that influencers kind of fill today. But they were so much more. They were like an older sister or a best friend who just knew everything. And sadly, all those magazines that I worked on and all the brands behind them over the years are now gone. Cosmo, Cleo, Dolly, Harper's Bazaar, Elle, Shop Till You Drop, Madison, they have all closed and fallen away. I started in magazines doing work experience at Clio when I was just 19 and I spent the next 15 years working in the most extraordinary industry with the most extraordinary women at the most extraordinary time. No idea was too big or too rude. No centrefold was too raunchy and it was totally acceptable to wear a tutu to work. Today, I want you to meet two of the most iconic magazine editors in Australia who were responsible for so many of the images and the stories that women just lived and breathed in the 90s and 2000s. Deborah Thomas and Paula Joy have between them worked at, launched or edited pretty much every important magazine in Australia. Deborah was my first boss when I started at Clio and she was the deputy editor. And Paula and I shared an office there for years. She was the one that introduced me to my husband and she's godmother to my firstborn. There is a lot of tea to spill about those years in magazines, from photo shoots with supermodels like Heidi Klum, Claudia Schiffer and Cindy Crawford. You know, you're there and they're naked in front of you and they're just another woman. But what those models had, and I've shot so many models and so many celebrities, but absolutely those women who were the supers, Cindy Crawford as well, you would put them in front of the camera and they would almost become a caricature because they just became that person. They became the one name, Giselle, Claudia, Kate. They're just literally a woman with one name. To working for the billionaire Packer family, what was that like? And visiting Kerry Packer in his office. Kerry sort of looking me over the top of his glasses and asking me what the beep I was going to do with his magazine. Here's my chat with two real-life magazine queens, Paula Joy and Deborah Thomas. Deb, you were my first boss ever. How did you get started in magazines? Because you were a model. I always had a fascination for magazines. And I think I got my first magazine subscription when I was about nine years old. We were allowed to have a magazine delivered and it was it came from the news agent, rolled up, thrown on the front lawn. It was called June and School Friend. Um, June and, and School, School Friend. Friend. It was English because in those days there weren't really Australian magazines. I think Flair, which I moved on to, which was the only real fashion magazine at that time. So always an absolute fascination. But obviously modelling, a lot of that was around the magazine industry, a lot of the designers and so on. And I started in Melbourne with um, a street magazine. So some friends of mine started a magazine called Crowd in Melbourne. And it was equivalent to one in Sydney, which was called Stiletto. So street mags, pretty out there fashion and so on at a time. They were usually free and I just loved it. I loved writing. I'd been to art school 
and I'd also been to NIDA doing design. So photography I loved. I loved the design of the pages, the type, everything about them. And I always thought I wanted to work in magazines. So when I moved to Sydney, I actually went around to a number of magazine companies to see if I could get a job. I even went to Dolly and they told me I think I was too old for it. But um, How old were you when you got into mags when you started? Was when, Cleo your first kind of Cleo, glossy? Cleo was my first paid magazine job and it was 1987 when I started. So I was... 31. And what was your role at Clio? Beauty and lifestyle editor. Was Lisa the editor then? Lisa was the editor and I remember being interviewed by Lisa. I was actually working in advertising. When I couldn't get a job in magazines after trying for Dolly and Follow Me and various others, I actually ended up in advertising and uh, a lot of the work that we did were ads for magazines and catalogues and someone who'd known me, who knew Lisa back from the crowd Street Magazine Days had suggested me for a job at Clio and it was between me and one other person who a lot of people would know but we won't go there. And I met with Lisa and she made me go and do a test story. She wanted to see how I wrote and she wanted to see how I would shoot that story and that test story was with a magazine astrologer called Athena Starwoman. Mm. And she must have liked it because I got the job. For those who aren't familiar with the role of a beauty editor, what did you have to do in that job? Oh, sift through all sorts of amazing new beauty products, look at tips and tricks for how women might like to apply makeup. But it was more than that. It was beauty in a broader sense. So it may be an article on nutrition or it could be an article on skincare. I think one that I actually did myself was Four Weeks to a New You, which was everything from exercise to what you ate, how you dressed and so on. I mean, we would even dress women for their shapes and stuff that we probably would never get away with these days. But uh, it was a really good role. And I know Paula will probably attest to the same thing. It was really good because you learnt the business from the ground up because not only did you have to think about what you were putting in the magazine for the readers, but because it was beauty, which was a major source of the advertising dollars, you had to have relationships with the various players at the PR companies. You had to think about visually how you'd present it as well as the words. So it was a really all-rounded job. And I think of the number of magazine editors that came out of beauty, it's quite extraordinary. You know, editors of Vogue and various other magazines. Paula, your first job was as an intern, I seem to recall. Was there a story about blow-drying a dog or did I imagine that? No, that's true. (laughs) And intern is far too modern. It was Girl Friday. Girl Friday at Vogue. So that was the first door that I knocked on and they needed somebody for work experience and their junior, their Girl Friday, left and I was Johnny on the spot or Josephine on the spot and I got the job. So Girl Friday at Vogue in 1990 was everything from running up and down the corridors with shoes and handbags and making coffees and photocopying a thousand, thousand things and also blow-drying the editor's dog's hair straight. (laughs) Why? (laughs) That is a true story that happened. I sort of think I was Anne Hathaway and Meryl Streep in my career. (laughs) I have actually been both and they were the Anne Hathaway years. From the Devil Wears Prada. Yes, and I remember being on a shoot and it was on a cliff The photographer and the model were down at the bottom of the cliff in a safe place and I was, all Friday, going up and down the cliff practically with an abseiling rope to get what the fashion editor needed. And I remember it was so windy and having this Versace dress, sort of like a flag in my hand and going to myself, you're going to have to kill yourself to save the dress. And I really was so happy to be at Vogue. I would have done anything to just, and I did do anything, just to breathe the air that was so rarefied and exciting and dynamic and amazing. Did you get paid? Well, that was another thing. They asked me how old I was. and How old were you? I was 19. And they said, you may be earning less than that, than your age. And indeed I was. Do you mean $1,000 per year? Twelve and a half. Twelve and a half thousand dollars a year. It was my first salary at Vogue. Wasn't one of the questions that they like to ask at Vogue, do you still live at home? That was the first. Because anyone living out of a home couldn't afford to work there, right, pretty much? No, you could Certainly couldn't. at entry level. No, and it was a really magical place at that time. It sort of wasn't in a big publishing house. It was just a sort of one solo place in Greenwich and there was a tea lady 
and chicken sandwiches came around without crusts on them and her name was Ruth and I cried to her a lot. <laughs> what did you cry about? Just being at Vogue. <laughs> <laughs> Were people mean? Because that's something that a lot of people say about magazines. Oh, it must be really mean. It must be really bitchy. Was that your experience? No. But these were incredible women and I was greener than the greenest blade of grass and so excited and determined and just didn't want to stuff up and wanted to try and take on as much as I could and please everybody and you know, the tears came from myself, not from the women around me. I mean, there were some witches on brooms, definitely flying past, but on balance, they were just extraordinary women. That I mean, what a start. Mm. What a start. It was such an incredible start, such incredible training. Once I had to iron for Vogue Living all these ribbons, so I had to cut ribbons into 10 centimetre pieces, then iron them and put them on name tags for an event and then iron the bow on top of the name tag. And that took me until about 2 a.m. the night before that I had to go and set up the next day at 7. But it's that discipline and it's that excellence and that's that standard that those five letters stood and still do stand for Mm. that was just amazing training. Deb, being at Clio in the 90s, it was really peak magazine in terms of those Cosmo Clio magazines. They were selling hundreds of thousands of copies. There was a fierce rivalry, even though they were in the same publishing house, and they were always trying to top one another by being outrageous. Do you remember any particular stories that sort of pushed the envelope during that time? God, how long have you got? (laughs) Um, I can think of so many that were happening even when I was there because It started really in the 80s where magazines really sort of, and I'm going to cite one out of the UK, which was Marie Claire run by Glenda Bailey, where it was not unusual to have pictures of naked men. I mean, we'd had the Clio centrefold for years, but always there'd be something discreetly placed to cover sort of the private parts. But um, it pushed the envelope. And I think of one in particular. I remember we were sitting in Lisa's office at an editorial meeting and it was always say whatever you like, just there's no such thing as a bad idea. Anyway, we decided to do a sealed section where we were going to show the best sex poses. And that seemed like a great idea, but how are we going to illustrate them? And I said to Lisa, I think that we should get some good looking models to demonstrate these poses and we'll get Daniela Federici to shoot them in a really kind of tactical way. Do you mean sex positions? Way. Sex positions. And then she said, oh, okay, that's a great idea. Where are we going to find these people to do this shoot? So I said, oh, I think we'll go and find a couple of really good looking sex workers, which I set out to do. And um, that was a task in itself. But in the end, we ended up with dancers because we found <gasps> dancers. They had beautiful bodies. They were used to sort of being entangled in positions. And, and they were very flexible. And they were very flexible. And we, we ran that. But I mean, oh, God, there was the Arnold Schwarzenegger. Do you remember the Arnold Schwarzenegger? Can you tell that story? Um, we got a photograph of an old photo of Arnold Schwarzenegger in the nude and advertisers had been complaining to the publisher about too many sort of naked, really naked men. And Lisa was away and I was deputy at the time and I had to go down to see Richard Walsh about running this picture because... He was the publisher. <clears throat> yes, he was the publisher. So all the women, let me set the scene, all the women would edit the magazines and work on the magazines but the bosses were at that time in the 80s and 90s always men. Yes. And even into the 2000s. Yes, and the advertisers were starting to get a little bit antsy both about Clio and Cosmo just pushing the envelope too much. Too sexy. Because whilst in Australia we were okay about it, when they would go back to America and the various cosmetic companies companies would see this, they would have a conniptions because nothing like that would happen in America. It was mm. much more prudish. And they would say, why is here? our lipstick and why is our fragrance in this exactly. smutty publication? Exactly. Anyway, the Arnold Schwarzenegger was a great story, a great photo of Arnold. And we'd just been shown this new scratchy technology, which is the same technology, of course, that they have on all of the lottery cards. And I remember saying to Richard, well, we're going to run the picture, but we're going to put some underpants on him in the scratchy stuff. So that way, and um, Lisa came back and the cover line was something along the lines of, is Arnie the biggest star in, in Hollywood? Scratch off his undies to find out. The only trouble was that this was such new technology so that when they put it on, the ink underneath hadn't dried. So when you actually scratched, you scratched off the photo as well. But it was you a made a art. hole in the page, I remember. But it was sort of revolutionary at mm. its time. Paula, do you remember you came to Clio when I was there? I came in about 92 Mm -hmm. and then you came and you and I shared an office for a long time. What are your memories of those that time at Clio? Because you always had an incredible creative vision and you'd go off on these elaborate shoots. I did. I also wore elaborate outfits. Yeah, you did. 
We would get very dressed up to go to work, particularly you. And that was one of the things I loved about working in magazines. You actually could be, I mean, Sex in the City is probably the best example. The opening credits of Sex in the City, did I wear tutus to work? I absolutely did. Did I love it? I absolutely did. But that period of time to be, I think I was beauty editor then and then lifestyle editor, wow, oh, wow. I mean, that was when there were budgets. That was when there was no idea was too big. You would go and shoot celebrities. Tell us about some of those stories, some of those shoots you were involved in. Well, I mean, there isn't a 90s supermodel that I didn't shoot. Claudia, Kate, Christy, Linda, Helena. And what was it like being on shoots with those women at the height of their (laughs) fame? It's hard to even, like, they were Kardashian level. It was the equivalent, right? Absolutely. Kardashians. Absolutely. If, so if not like? bigger. Um, you know, it's funny. It's sort of, a, you know, you're there and they're naked in front of you and they're just another woman. But what those models had, and I've shot so many models and so many celebrities, but absolutely those women who were the supers, Cindy Crawford as well, you would put them in front of the camera and they would almost become a caricature Because they just became that person. They became the one name, Giselle, Claudia, Kate. They're just literally a woman with one name. They're so enmeshed in your body and in your DNA and the way that they knew light. They were proper, proper, proper mannequins. All three of us worked at Clio and were involved in doing Australia's Most Eligible Bachelors. Yes. What are any, both of your memories of different bachelor stories? I have a great one of being knocked back by Aaron Pedersen, who I thought was into me the year that he won. And then I went back to his hotel room and tried to kiss him and he just went, no. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> that was incredibly awkward. I, I don't have anything that exciting. I was probably in, in the early days. I don't think any of the bachelors came on to me, sadly. I'm a bit young. But I do remember the first Well, they didn't bachelor. come on to me either, it would seem. I do remember holding the first Bachelor of the Year lunch and Ben Mendelsohn being there and asking me if he could borrow my makeup and... He went into the bathroom and he came back with mascara and That's before his eye. men wore makeup, Yeah, but, really. so that was pretty kind of out there. But no, most of the bachelor shoots that I remember being on, Paula was always involved. So they're always probably mm. happier to see Paula than me turn up for any interviews, I'm yeah. sure. Hey, what are your <laughs> memories of Bachelor? Oh, Cause just you, really. Men are hard work. I mean, I shot how many years did I do? I had to have shot at least seven of them, mm. I think, and that is a lot of men and they're just fragile egos about being on camera to handle. And in the years when you were shooting them, they had to take off more and more clothes as time went on, didn't they? So back in the 80s and the early 90s, they were pretty clothed. But by the end, it was like... I always tried to give it a theme because I just didn't ever... I never liked it looking messy. So, you know, headshots coming in from all around. So I always tried to theme it. So I'd take something like water. One year I did in bed and it was just black and white shots of them aerial on a bed. But that was hot. With a sheet over them and naked. Yeah, which was good. And then I did one with hoses and water one year, which was good. So, yes, I probably am responsible for derobing the bachelors. Actually, in the beds, I remember we did bachelors in their bedrooms, literally in their own bedrooms. And that was always really telling to see what a guy had in his bedroom. And I love that because one room we went into was so messy, but it was fascinating to see every little bit of everything, every bit of junk around him. But Do you remember some of the scandals? Because there would always be, it was seen to be a real badge of honour if you were a gay guy and you snuck onto the list, and invariably someone always would, because it was meant to be Australia's most eligible heterosexual bachelors. I don't even know if you could do that anymore. It probably wouldn't wash. But do you remember any funny stories about people getting on the list and how you decided who was on and who was off? We had a couple of moments that kept me awake at night. I think one was when we got a call from a current affair that one bachelor was being investigated by the police. I remember that. Remember that? And then there was another one where, oh, my God, he's not yet divorced. And you always were a little bit worried that a wife might appear from somewhere. (laughs) I mean, let's face it. Or a gay we, lover. We actually put our lives on the line to deliver yeah. those boys. Yeah. They were hard yeah. work. Mm. Gay lover wasn't a problem. We actually had mm. some that I think we knew were gay. Some of the confirmed bachelors, confirmed rather bachelors. Than eligible but there was always bachelors. a Definite thought that, bachelors. that they could change their minds. They could, especially now. Now yeah. that would be very, very much seen as acceptable and. Yeah, it's a funny thing, Bachelors. It was so right for the time. It's so funny to look at it now because it's so kind of. 
strange that it was ever relevant and fabulous, but when we did it, it really was. I'm Deborah Thomas. I have been editor of the Australian Women's Weekly, Clio, Elle magazine, Mode, which um, went on to become Harper's Bazaar, and also Fashion Quarterly. And you're listening to No Filter. Hi, I'm Paula Joy. I have edited Clio magazine, Shop to Drop, Madison, and you are listening to No Filter. When you look back now at the industry in terms of where we've come to with body image and models and understanding all of that, do you look back at those times and some of the models that you worked with and think, oh, that wasn't right? Or do you think it was just a a moment in time? I look at some of the models, probably they got skinnier and skinnier and skinnier and younger and younger and younger. I think when I was modelling, I mean, I didn't start modelling until I was 21. And even back in the early days of Clio, a lot of the models that we were working with were not 15, 14. They were usually 18, 19, 20. And a size 10 was the size. But then it went down, it got down to eight, it got down to six. Mm. And look, that's always been the question that goes round and round in your heads, doesn't it, about how much you influence young women about some sort of idea of what beauty is. And I probably think it was that. I mean, even I was like that when I was growing up. Those big M milk girls running along the beach in bikinis with long, straight blonde hair, I wanted to be them and I wasn't. I was a bit freaky with curly, frizzy hair. You know, it just didn't quite work. So there's always been ideas of beauty that people have tried to attain and probably what I'd say is that I'd like to think that I didn't have any really sort of girls in there that were bad role models but potentially you probably did. What would you look for when you cast a girl, P? Different for different titles, of course, and different sort of demographics. But you were editing through grunge. I did, but how did you deal with that? I was look, all my magazines were Australian. So I had a very Australian girl aesthetic always Mm. in the pages, which ranged from Jessica Gomes, who's, you know, Asian Australian, Samantha Harris, who's indigenous, to Christy Hins to Kate Bell was really my genre, Tanya Linney. So I had... Jodie Mears. Jodie Mears. I had a very Australian, almost athletic aesthetic, but I also started shooting Miranda Kerr for Madison when no one really was. And she was also Australian country. Erica Packer, Baxter then, used to shoot her a lot. So I really went for local girls a lot of the time. But I did see it switch. I saw it switch from those supermodels heavily into you know, heroin chic, Mm. Mm. which isn't that hilarious that that even was a term? But heroin was heroin chic, chic. like, come on. I think that the most kind of insulting things in some ways for women was when the magazines, and I'm probably guilty of this, would shoot a big girl. And the big girl was a size 14. And that's crazy. That was a normal size. I mean, I'm a size 14, 16, because I'm 180 centimetres. But back to Paula's point, We were lucky we were on Australian magazines. We weren't on the high fashion magazines where they wanted to follow the overseas trends. It was very much, and particularly Cleo, that outdoor, healthy beach babe. Well, the swimsuit issue was something that I really sort of pioneered, I guess, in the spirit of Sports Illustrated, and we turned it into a television show ultimately. But I look back at those girls, and all of those girls still were healthy Mm. looking than most. Heroin and chic didn't really take it, off in Australia. And the actually, Australian titles. I can tell you one terrible story. I wasn't the editor, but I knew the fashion editor. And she had taken an Australian model to Bali. And this girl had been exactly like we we're describing, really healthy. And then she turned up on the shoot and she looked like she had anorexia. Mm. And I'll always remember coming back and it's the first time I've ever seen an art director trying to make a model look bigger Mm. using Photoshop than the other way around. I used to sometimes say that to my art directors, can you get rid of her ribs, when we just shouldn't have cast her in the first place. You know what I think I noticed more, funnily enough, sometimes in people that I worked with or people that worked in the building and people that were sort of around that aesthetic, less so with models sometimes, but I there were a few times that it were young girls or people on the team that, you know, just got a bit affected by seeing sample sizes and everything all the time. I think that that sometimes was unhealthy for mm. people's brains, seeing that look the whole time. I remember our friend Kirsty Clements, who was the editor of Vogue, wrote in her book about 
being on a shoot with a model who was eating tissues to try and suppress her appetite. Never saw anything like that. But by that stage, I'd moved to Women's Weekly and I loved the fact that at Women's Weekly we were shooting beauty on 40-year-old women and 50-year-old women and they were modelling the clothes and that was something that I was really proud of, that we were able to to show that you could be beautiful at any age as you you got older. And I think me and you and I were also on the cusp of it changed to Celebrities on Covers A and then also reality television. At the end of my time at Clio, shows like Temptation Island, I would actually do fashion shoots on the stars of that and actually start using, what is a better word for real people? Yeah, I know, (laughs) non-models. I think. That is such magazine yeah. talk. Let's, yeah, we used instead to call, of a fake person, let's use a real person. Yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> we used to call them real women, and fashion editors used to hate nothing more than shooting in quote marks real women. Why is that, Deb? Why do the the fashion editors, the designers, the photographers, why did they always want the skinniest girls? They lived in an unreal world, not all, but most of them. I'll even go back to my early days in in modelling and um, being 180 and I was probably at my absolute skinniest and I walked into Givenchy, the couture house, and the first thing that they did was check my height, tick, then a tape measure went around my hips and at that size I was probably a size 8. I was really considered skinny. So there's always been this fashion thing of skinny women. Even if you go back and look at fashion photos from the 50s, you'll see very, very thin women. So there's this high fashion kind of ideal that is totally unrealistic that – and I've seen fashion editors and it's sort of sometimes they're just they're caught into it up in a different world and a different aesthetic. Because they think clothes fall better. better. They and, say. You, you know, and you've heard some designers comment that they don't want anyone over a size 10 mm. wearing their clothes. And it's just – Ridiculous, but I'd like to think that a lot of that has changed, that the commercial realities and also just a sort of responsibility have changed that. But I would often see a fashion editor and they got it, but whenever they'd bring the pictures, the pictures just didn't represent anything other than this kind of old school style of a super skinny model looking really freaky in some sort of clothing that nobody else in the world could wear. We all worked for the Packer family when Mm -hmm. they owned the magazines that we worked at and edited. Deb, you had probably more to do with the Packers than Paula and I ever did because you edited the Women's Weekly and you were there when Kerry was still alive. What were your experiences of Kerry and the Packer family? Oh, gosh, again, where do you start? Packer family, very fond of the Packer women that I know very well, Ros and Gretel. When I started at Cleo, Gretel worked at Cleo and um, she was learning the family business and the first shoot I ever went on was with Gretel. So you were Gretel's boss, weren't you? Was that difficult? No, Lisa was really Gretel's boss. I was probably more senior to Gretel, but not specifically Mm. her boss. But we did quite a few things together. And the one thing I'll say about Gretel, she never, ever... Pull rank. She, she was, was in a always, very junior role. Wasn't she was in she? a junior role, always happy to get her hands dirty. She was just fantastic. And um, same with Roz. And I think back probably a couple of the major encounters with Kerry, and God, I had enough of them at the Women's Weekly. One was going into his office, and that was probably the scariest office I've ever been to in my entire What was it like? I never went in. It was huge, and it had a huge desk with a huge man, and on the walls around the room were all these pictures of the great white hunter felling rhinos and elephants and not photos but paintings. And Kerry sort of looking at me over the top of his glasses and asking me what the – I was going to do with his magazine. But he was amazing. He was really interested in what people were doing. He observed. I always remember one incident where he said to me, I was down there and he asked me if people were eating fish at home or was it just a restaurant food? And I thought that's a very interesting question from Australia's richest man. But he was interested in the way people behave. So I answered him and my answer came from my own observations in the supermarket. I won't bore you with it now. But essentially he liked that because he liked to watch people. Like, you know, people don't want to go home without knowing who won the cricket. He would ring up Channel 9 and ask a question that was obvious. And I I had the privilege of working with Roz and Gretel when Kerry died as well and going up to the house and getting all the photos and doing a fabulous tribute in the the magazine but he you also loved covered the Women's James's Weekly. wedding you were the editor yes. when James got married what was that like Paula and I were at that wedding as well James's first wedding what was it like to have the responsibility of covering that wedding being the only media outlet I had every lab photo lab booked that particular 48 hours to 
develop the photos. I had security guards, I probably had every freelance security guard booked who was taking photos backwards and forwards, guarding labs, doing the whole thing, calling off choppers from various publications. And can you talk a bit about the wedding itself? The Your wedding memories of it. Well, the wedding itself was amazing. It was as you know, dancing cheek to cheek with Elton John, singing the most extraordinary wine and food, and a marquee it was a three story marquee. That yeah, they'd it's funny built to call it a marquee. It's the, not the kind of marquee that you know out the the back. But I was running in and out to the house all the time because I was actually editing the photos as they would come back from the the lab. So sadly, I couldn't enjoy all those beautiful vintage champagnes and wines. The next morning, I was at the office and we laid out. All all of the pages and we spent a few days doing it and we we're checking things with Mrs Packer and so on and it just gone to the printers and I'd gone to the gym to relax and I was lying on the one of the machines and went it's wrong and I remember ringing and saying hold the presses stop it's too squashed I think it was only eight pages and it should have been 14 so I got all the staff back in and we completely redid it the only copies that ever went beyond went to Perth because we couldn't stop those ones because they literally went over by truck they got the seven pages and everywhere else in the country got the 14. I just got PTSD then because (laughs) I have actually had you going wait (laughs) stop (laughs) stop it's wrong. Let's turn it into this. That's, that is vintage you, actually, and you're always right. You are always right. Deb, you've um, edited probably Australia's most iconic magazine in the Women's Weekly. But, Paula, you've started two magazines from scratch, which is something that very few people in the world have ever done. Mm-hmm. And you've done it twice, and they were both extraordinarily successful magazines, Shop Till You Drop and Madison. How does that happen? And how do you design a magazine from a blank page? I was so lucky. I mean, I really was lucky. And they were both massive privileges and could not have been more different in their execution. So Shop to You Drop was literally launched using Clio staff in the broom cupboard that was off Clio. So I was doing Clio during the day, Shop to You Drop at night was just super, super sticky and and everybody was just like, what do you think of this? What do you think of this? And we was on the run, on the run to the point where we were going to call it Just Shop, but News Corp owned that. And right up until the end, when the whole magazine was done, the cover was done, we'd done the logo, it was called Shop, lawyers were like, it'll happen, it'll happen, never happen. So we were standing there, it had to go to press, and we just, Pat Ingram, the publisher at the time, said, well, come on, we'll just, we've got to just, let's do it. And I said, well... You shop till you drop. Okay, that'll do. And people, of course, in the beginning didn't get shop. It was called shop till you flop. For a long time, that was what advertising agencies called it in the really? beginning. Really? Shop till you flop. I remembered it as a smash hit out of the gates. It was. Yeah, me It was too. a smash hit out of the gates because it was oh. a one shot. But, I mean, it was just such an easy play on words. It was such a success and I don't think people thought that that could be sustained. And it was always a one shot, we'll see what happens. It went quickly to a quarterly. It then went very quickly to 10 and then it became 12 issues a year. And, of course, had amazing editors, Kerry McCallum and Justine Cullen, that took it to extraordinary heights. But it was the first magazine that was a fashion magazine but also understood that maybe you weren't into high fashion because I've always loved clothes but I've never really related to the fancy fashion magazines and Shop Till You Drop was almost like the democratisation of fashion in a magazine form. Yeah, absolutely. And for me, I just wanted to create a true tunnel, just shoes and lipstick. That is how I thought about Shop. It's just shoes and lipstick. Sometimes you don't want advice, sex, angst, food. And this is something you can share with your daughter, your grandmother, your aunt. I just wanted something that was, yes, democratic and also just for every woman Mm -hmm. at every stage that could be left on a coffee table, in a doctor's office, whatever, because I, you know, had come out of having to have every single cover line legaled for, you know, a thousand reasons. So it was just a very sanitised, safe, fun, happy magazine. Didn't we call it a magalog at the time? Yes, yeah, Yeah. like a catalogue, exactly so. It sort of came off that sort of thinking. And then Madison was completely different and when we did that it was incredibly staffed. It was a a very, very serious big business. But when I went to start that with a blank page, I took every single reference out of the offices that we had. I didn't have any magazines that existed. 
I said, I want everything that comes in here to be art. You can bring in fabric. You can bring in prints. We had swing tags from different brands. I took away every reference from publishing that I could and I said, this is an opportunity that we'll never get again, that none of us are ever going to get again. Just be Mm. creative. And I drew the whole magazine by hand, the first issue. Like I had a notebook. I still have it. And it was one of the great experiences of my life. And it was wonderful making it with Australian women in Australia with an incredible Australian media company. And I really do feel we hit. Oh, you did. You did a great I think job it on landed really well mm. for Australian women. How long were you there? And I think it's missed. Mm. Six years. That was always my rule edit for six years and then let someone else have a go. <laughs> Deb, what's it like to inherit something that's so iconic? You know, you became the editor of the Australian Women's Weekly, which at the time was the most important magazine editorship in Australia. How do you fill those shoes? It's a funny one because I was scared. I thought, can I do that or not? I was actually 42, so I felt a bit young to be doing the weekly, to be perfectly honest. But I'd got married just before that, so Kerry was fine. I don't think that at those days, unless you were married, you were able to do the Women's Weekly. Ah. Things have changed, but I think it was a bit of that. The hardest part is to change something like that. Now, I was lucky because when I went in there, the company, I checked that they were ready for change. I mean, I had that conversation with Kerry because if you go in there and you want to change something like that, then the company's not going to change when it makes that much money and it's sort of the flagship and Kerry grew up with it, his father started and all of the history that comes with it. So there was a a mood for change. Change happened a lot quicker than I thought it would happen in that the first week I was there, I was told to um, retrench half the staff, which was pretty um, frightening. But the magazine had been up and down for a while. So I basically got instructions, you know, go up there and drag it into the 21st century and don't lose a reader. What year was this? It was 1999. And what did it look like or how was it vibing at the time? It was a bit schizophrenic because it had been for me the sort of the grand magazine. When I'd grown up, I'd always thought of the Women's Weekly as a very sort of sophisticated, inspirational and quite glamorous magazine. And it'd become very much like the, a lot of the tabloids. It had sort of got to the point where it was competing with Women's Day, Women's Weekly, and there were paparazzi shots and not beautiful photography in there. So mm, I felt that it had lost its way trying to keep that number of readers. And so my thing was, we're going to change it. We're going to take all those little bitsy photos off, which I used to call pizza with the lock covers. And we're going to do one beautiful big image. Like I remember the Women's Weekly when I was growing up, we'll do beautiful photo stories of amazing Australians and and have them in the magazine. And you had to also think about the trust and the credibility that came with it. P, do you remember a particular time that you would describe as peak magazine? You know, the devil wears Prada kind of ideal, maybe in your beauty times, like something that people just wouldn't quite believe actually went on and that would never happen now. I think I was lucky that I probably got it for most of my time. But certainly beauty in the early to mid-90s was crazy in terms of the economy was so robust that you would literally – have a mascara launch in Singapore where you would be flown to a five-star hotel, to another five-star hotel, possibly on a small plane or a catamaran with somebody fanning you, and then you would be presented with a mascara, which was, guess what, a mascara, (laughs) and then you would go back on the catamaran and back to your desk in Sydney and write about it unbelievable sort of things like that happen. And happened. you would be like a 22-year-old beauty editor. Yes, mm. and just wearing the wrong thing and just feeling just this is just crazy, pinch me moments. There's was certainly a lot of moments in fashion, so beyond sort of overseas collections and the absolute splendour of things like Chanel shows and and the International Fashion Weeks, I do remember one moment where I really was like, are you kidding me right now? was when I went to Madonna's Malawi Benefit with Gucci in New York and Katie and Tom were still together. Mm. J-Lo was pregnant with the twins, with Mark Anthony. Anna was hosting it with Madonna and I was on the dance floor watching Jay-Z and Rihanna do Umbrella 
Alicia Keys singing and they're next um, to J-Lo with glow sticks. Was this a mascara again? No, this was a benefit for Malawi that oh. Madonna was hosting with American Vogue but Gucci. Oh, Gucci took had some tickets. F- yes, and I, don't, I was in New York and anyway... And that was one of those crazy times yeah. where you were just thinking, this is all because this of my last. job. And it, this is insane. But um, it still is my happy place, J-Lo pregnant with the glow sticks in her hands. <laughs> Sometimes when I get sad, I just go back there and <laughs> it makes me happy. Isn't it funny, those sorts of things? I'm gonna. My version of that was Carl Lagerfeld inviting us all to his house in Monte Carlo for a launch of a new fragrance. And flown into Paris and chopped down to Monte Carlo. And there were three magazine editors from each country, so they had the Italian girls and so on. We're all given memberships to the Monte Carlo Beach Club. Nobody's in the pool except the Aussies. We're the only ones who got in the pool because everybody's so perfectly groomed. And I'll always remember that night we went to dinner. Princess Caroline was at the dinner dressed top to toe in Chanel. Michael Hutchins, Helmut Newton and his wife. Michael was still with Helene Christensen at that time. Like unbelievable guests that Carl had bought. And I'm standing there and Michael Hutchins is having a conversation with Helmut Newton, the two Aussies. And I was standing there as the third Aussie. And Michael's going, oh, mate, one of you wanted to have you for a barbecue, but couldn't find your number. And the helmet's like, but we're in the phone book. And I'm thinking, I've got to get my hands on the Monte Carlo phone book. (laughs) Anyway, they both looked up and they looked around. They said, no, I haven't been to this place. I haven't seen what Carl's done. You know, he said, "Um, Carl got this place from Rainier for a steal, an absolute steal, because Rainier, being Prince Rainier. Of um, Monaco. Of Monaco, hadn't wanted to do it up. And he said, yeah, that Rainier's, he's such a bloody cheapskate. And I'm thinking, (laughs) I'm standing here listening to this conversation. (laughs) Anyway, we went back to our rooms. We're staying at the Monte Carlo Hotel. We saw Robert Redford at the front desk and then we went up to our bedroom and our suite and then on the bed was a beautiful map of the stars and someone had named a star after us. Anyway, we got back to Australia and the perfume company cancelled the fragrance. (gasps) Now, that must have been, I don't know, how many millions of dollars, but they just sent us all a note going, oh, we decided not to launch it. The face of that perfume was Daryl Hannah, so she would have been on a a huge amount of money. I mean, it was unbelievable. So to actually have it cancelled. But on the flip side of that, creatively, was also peak where you could – I mean, I remember when we did the Olympics – We had the Olympics in Australia, travelling around with a photographer to all of our athletes and doing the most extraordinary black and white images on the rock and on horses and, you know, having the budget to shoot celebrities and take them places and be creative and just do what I think magazines have and will forever do, which is images and just the emotion of images that paper and ink give you. Mm. That was peak magazine to me, beyond the sort of eventing and everything, to be able to take someone and create an incredible image that made people feel something and show you that person or something in another way. That was an amazing portfolio. I remember that really well. That was such and, a, and such a great thing to you do. You raise a really good point and you touched on it earlier. Well, I think, Mia, you'd be well aware of it as well, is the fact that women's magazines in their time were more than just fashion and beauty and how to dress. We did stories for women on their careers, on really important health issues that young women should be aware of. So, I mean, even when I was thinking about my career, I would often read Cleo in the early days and be reading about women who had jobs that I would really like to have had that job or how could I get to that job or other sorts of things that were pretty important in sort of Mm. shaping where I wanted to go and what I wanted to do with my life. And Cosmo and Cleo were very instrumental and Dolly in sex education around safe sex in the 90s. That was Mm. kind of when we came of age and when we were there because that was the only women's media that existed and young women who were becoming sexually active for the first time were learning those kind of things and things around smoking and things around skin cancer. There were so many health messages that magazines would propagate. Pete, when did you realise magazines were in trouble and why did you decide to get out? I think I noticed that they were in trouble about 2008 probably, 2008, it just started. There was just such a change in the world beyond the internet. Traditionally they live in newsagents and supermarkets and even the way that we shopped and, and just online shopping and just the way that the world was turning was not the same. And also there were people that were growing up that were like, what's a newsagent? You know, Mm. so I think I could really just see it. And then, of course, you see it in sales and you see it in the fact that brands are looking around and going, oh, well, 
that's interesting over there and I might try outdoor or I might try this thing called the internet or, you know, and then, of course, there was Facebook and then there was Instagram and social started and then it really started to change Twitter, I guess, first. But I wanted to keep working. I'm a nerd at heart and digital was really interesting at basis, really, really interesting. You were obviously really instrumental for me in just showing me this new world and this new way and and all your bravery in pioneering it. I couldn't get a job anywhere else. (laughs) Wasn't that brave? (laughs) No one would offer me a job. We had a lot of conversations about it and I was like, keep the money, keep taking the money. As long as the party's still on, stay at the magazine party. You did say that, but you're like, but get your Twitter handle, get your Instagram handle and start making a parachute Get ready to eject. Get ready. And I, I really wanted to keep being creative. I am a creative. I didn't have aspiration to be a publisher or a media executive. I like being coalface. And I'd also, I said, I have a six-year rule. I think once you've done the cover lines for six years, for me anyway, the sort of person I am, it was time to move on. And like you said, I made two magazines and I never wanted to look back in anger. Mm-hmm. I never wanted to look back and be sad because I had the greatest fucking time. Deb, what about you? I had been at the Women's Weekly for about nine years and figured it was time to, I probably had a three-year rule, but suddenly I had three by three and decided it was probably time for me to leave. And Unfortunately, it happened at the time of the GFC. So it was a weird sort of space because I had presumed that I would go to the next level in the organisation and that sort of didn't happen. So my role actually ended up looking for new revenue streams to basically plug some of the holes that we're now Mm. starting to show from lack of sales and less advertisers. So I really enjoyed that because that was an exercise in what does the brand represent. So, for example, Women's Weekly was not only the magazine, but the cookbooks were huge. And then we started a Women's Weekly kitchen range and saucepans and and then um, obviously there was the opportunities on social media and digital and how did you do that. So the whole thing became a kind of holistic brand. And funny enough, the audience got bigger and bigger and bigger But what happens is that you're producing a lot of content that people were getting for free. So the business Mm. model started to crack. You know, we were always looking for sort of new things to do. There were puzzles. House and Garden went off and and started with the editor of House and Garden, a homewares brand through Maya. That went from like zero to $12 million in sales in a year. So that was where I kind of shifted, I think, out of magazines and started to think more about what do these mastheads represent and Mm. what can they be in the broader sense and sort of left it there. I got out before the Packers sold the magazine company. You two had the experience of working for the Packers and an owner-operator and then working for private equity. What did you find the biggest differences? Because, you know, the Packers used to – some magazines made no money and they'd keep them open just because they were iconic, like the Bulletin. Then private equity came in and it was – would you say – I don't want to put words in your mouth, but was it a less sentimental view, a less passionate view? Private equity is always a less sentiment. I don't think mm. they have sentimental views on anything. It's a private equity is about taking a distressed asset, pulling it back and re kind of working it and presenting it for sale. Unfortunately, in this case, I think they misjudged media like cosmetics, they're sort of nuanced businesses and private equity going in and and doing their usual rules around productivity, how many times is a page handled and what is the cost of the handling of that page and so on, just doesn't work in a business that is basically driven by emotions. And Mm. when I say driven by emotions, I'm mainly talking about the customer or, you know, the person who's going to buy the magazine. It's just much more nuanced. So I think they were surprised and, you know, it's no secret that they did their dough as a result of that, but they didn't understand the trends. I mean, I reckon James must have had a few champagnes the night after they sold to private equity because even if they'd gone and asked a media student about the future of magazines at that time, as Paula said, it was, you know, anybody could have told you that Mm. magazines were not looking very healthy. Mr. Packer, this is the difference. He would come into my office when I was editing Cleo and he'd get the chair from the other side of the desk and he'd drag it around and he'd sit it next to me on my side of the desk and he'd say, kid and then talk to me about whatever it was but he was there because he cared (laughs) he did he'd say kid and I'd be like hi but he would always be there because he'd want to know what's going on and concerned and he gosh I learned so much from him he really was extraordinary but he knew and his company knew that their business was people 
And that's the reason they kept the bulletin open. And it's the reason because it wasn't brands. He knew that his brands were great because of his people. And Mm -hmm. he really knew that. And I think that private equity just by nature is different. It's acquisition. Mm. And I think people don't necessarily yes. fall into acquisitional sort of terminology. Uh, so that was the biggest difference I felt. Of all the magazines we all worked on, the only one that's still standing, and there's probably a dozen that we still worked on, the only ones of Vogue, which you worked on, Pay, and the Women's Weekly, yeah. which you edited, Deb, How have you felt when you've been hearing about this magazine's closed and that magazine's closed? I mean, all of these iconic brands like Dolly and Cosmo and Clio and Madison and Shop Till You Drop and Elle, they've all closed shop in Australia and disappeared. Well, my my first thought is for the people who work on those magazines because everybody who works on magazines, my experience is pretty passionate about what they do. They're talented. They have a belief. And um, And they're hard workers, right? They're hard workers, yeah. They say don't work on a magazine if you want to work nine to five, you know, unless you want to work nine to five in the morning, seven days a week. All Uh, our stories about the parties and everything, it's, yeah, the rest of it is the hard work that goes on the rest of the time. So, you know, I kind of feel, and I I read it somewhere and kind of like a light bulb, it's like, oh, my God, the only one, main ones left standing are the gossip magazines. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think I speak for the three of us that when we did stories, we did them in a responsible way. We were always kind of conscious of making sure that what we printed was the truth that what we printed was decent towards the people that we were interviewing, that we were respectful of our readers. And then you've now got magazines standing who just print stuff that someone's made up in a room and they don't have any reality in it. And I find that's really disappointing. And I think that's probably the thing that's come out of this is this idea of we trusted magazines and the people and we trusted our readers to trust us and that trust is gone. Mm. I hope you enjoyed listening to that as much as I enjoyed that little wander back down memory lane. Both Deb and Paula have gone on to reinvent themselves after magazines. Deborah is now the CEO of Camp Quality, a cancer charity for kids. And Paula is a digital content creator and lady startup. You must check out her Instagram and her website, thejoy.com. If you want to hear some other episodes in this genre of magazine queens, check out my chat with InStyle America's editor, Laura Brown, who is very much Australian and worked with Deborah and Paula and I over the years before she went to the US. You can just follow the links in our show notes. This episode was produced by Leah Porges. The executive producer of No Filter is Eliza Ratliff. I'm Mia Friedman, and I'll see you on mamamia.com.au.